so I'm keen to chat about coaching, but talk to me about your playing days first. Uh, sure. I mean, I'm always kind of like a little bit understated about my playing days because I don't want, I don't want that to interfere with me as a coach, if you know what I mean. If I can try and separate, look, I was a player once and I have my experiences um, and knowledge of a player, but that doesn't mean that that's going to transfer into being a coach. Um, so I, I try my hardest to uh, not talk about it or not tell people about it, but um, but it definitely helps you as a coach, I think, because you get that awareness and that um, and that experience. Um, but yeah, no, I, I had a decent playing career. I wish it was a little bit longer. Um, so yeah, South Africa born and raised and went through the systems there and then try to use rugby as a, as a tool to travel. And um, stopped off in Scotland on my way to California and came out for a six month rugby holiday about seven, seven years ago. So it's turned from, uh, yeah, it's turned, it's turned into something bigger, which is cool. Yeah, nice one. And I, can't, I, can't, I think I get what you mean uh, with what you're saying there, but what, what when you say you want to like separate your playing and coaching? Um, I feel like when you're a player, you kind of get an, an identity of yourself as a player and you think you're this kind of player and you kind of, because you're a player, you kind of know exactly what to do for the most part, depending on the level you're at. Uh, what to do as a player but that like you can't rely on that when you become a coach because the people that you're teaching are not seeing things seeing things um, through your eyes and your perspective and you've got to find a way to teach them differently because they're not going to understand or they're not going to see the same picture as you um, I always joke with a lot of my players that I don't know if you've watched the, the Netflix I think it was on Netflix Queen's Gambit and it's about this, uh, this this girl in this orphanage, and she learns how to play chess. And they give uh, they give them some kind of medication to uh, basically keep them wired. And and every night she pops the medication and basically plays chess on the ceiling with herself. And I often tell my players like that's that's the way I'm seeing the game because I've played at a higher level than what I'm coaching at now. But now I've got to teach you um, in a more simplistic way so that you can understand what I'm seeing, which is really difficult and which has been the biggest challenge for me as a coach. And I'm sure you understand too um, with your coaching right now. Yeah, 100%. And it's something that at the start, when I started coaching, I really was shocked at how difficult it was and how different it was from being a player. So like I started when I was maybe 21 with the like under 17s in my club back home. And I remember the first session I did, I like couldn't talk. I like froze and I had all this information in my head. I knew, you know, all this and I couldn't, I just literally couldn't do it. Yeah, mate, it's, it's such a challenge. Um, and especially that delivery point, like you, you kind of have a plan in your head, you know, you've set your plan, you, you, you've got all this knowledge, but then your ability to um, deliver the message in the right tone and try and relate to the, the people you're teaching, that is the challenge. And I think, man, I think even Paul O'Connell said it the other day, it's the rugby part's the easy part, like the, the knowledge and the skills and stuff that you acquire, that's easy, but how, how can you teach that in the most efficient way you possibly can? Um, so yeah, I know, like, but it's, it's an ever evolving challenge for me because, you know, once you think you've nailed it, you actually haven't because you go back and you go, oh, geez, like, Feels like I'm going backwards here, but yeah, I, I wouldn't know because I'm I'm not being taught by myself. But um, yeah, no, it's it's a, it's a serious challenge. Yeah, it's so true. You say as well. Um, whenever you think you've nailed it, you're you couldn't be further from the truth. Oh, mate, the more you the more you know, the more you don't know. Yeah, yeah, and so chat to me. So you played in South Africa, and then. What teams were involved in there, and then you decided just that you wanted to kind of travel a bit? Um, yeah, so obviously, you know, schoolboy rugby in South Africa is massive. Um, I was in a relatively smaller uh, school, rugby school, um, but went to the Sharks straight out of school and did relatively well. I made the age grade sides there. Um, 
but as you know, if once you hit 21 in South Africa, if you don't have a senior contract, you, you're pretty you're pretty close to done. Um, was able to play a bit of varsity cup, which has now created another level of you know recognition, which was pretty cool. Um, and then played a bit of club rugby in Cape Town, a bit of provincial sevens. But at the age of 24 in South Africa, if you haven't cracked it, you're done. But you often, you know, because you're so naive and so uh, immature, you don't know that there's, there's actually a lot of rugby out there and, and there could be a place where you actually want it elsewhere. So I kind of got to the stage where, look, I've given it a full crack. I'm not going to make it much further here in South Africa. Um, but I've got an opportunity to travel and play rugby in different countries. And I thought that was a cool, like, how do I use rugby to travel, you know, play five or six different seasons in five or six different countries. Like, you know, just embrace it, play as long as you can. And um, was pretty connected in Scotland through um, high school friend, David Denton, obviously played for Scotland. And he put me in touch with the club there. Uh, so went to play for a couple of months and then actually got called into the Edinburgh a uh, wider training group because they had a bit of a scrum off crisis. So I played two games for their, their A side, um, which was a great experience, but I'd already set up my next journey, which was out here to California to play in Santa Monica. So I played a bit of club rugby in Santa Monica. And then the next year, rugby went professional in America. And all of us foreigners got five year visas. And I got drafted down to the San Diego team. Um, so I moved down here. And then uh, that league actually folded off the the one year um but i wanted to stay and i wanted to do, to really uh, get stuck in um i really enjoyed san diego i wanted to try and put some roots down and got stuck into the coaching um would have loved to play mr uh san diego legion uh, ironically didn't want me so i got a few i got a few offers elsewhere but they just didn't make sense you know i wanted to kind of get a head start as a coach but i felt if i started earlier then i could you know, I could build the, climb the ladder a little bit quicker. So, yeah. Nice one. And so you played in that pro rugby and then where, what was your first kind of step into coaching? It literally under eights, under eights rugby, Coastal Dragons Rugby Club. Um, you know, I just helped out at my local club, just, you know, from the bottom up and I'd done a little bit of youth coaching in South Africa and I loved it. Like it was like, I really just, you know, like it instilled a bit of a passion in me in developing young rugby players. Um, and I enjoyed it. And then just, yeah, slowly worked my way up and coached a little bit of high school. Um, started running skills camps on my own. Um, and then obviously got Perry Baker involved and we, and we now run camps together and then got the job at the University of San Diego and, and then just, yeah, just slowly chipped away. But that first coaching was all youth, uh, right at the bottom grassroots, um, coaching, which in hindsight is probably the best thing for me, um, as a coach, because it challenges you, um, and forces you to, to, to really be attentive on the way you communicate, the details. I mean, I know it's a little bit chaotic at that level, but a little bit higher level, let's say 14, 16, you almost become a little bit more deliberate and aware of what specifically you need to, to improve in order for the team to kind of move in the right direction. Um, obviously, yeah, you know, just the fundamental skills just aren't there yet, but you're able to then identify the critical few over the important many because you're so calm poor. Um, so yeah, just started at youth at youth level, even though, you know, after finishing playing professionally, you naturally think, well, I'm, I'm way overqualified for this. Um, but I'm, I'm so glad that I, I started at youth level and I, I still coach under eights up to, up to men's today because I kind of need to be stimulated both ways. I could coach, a session I could do a private session with Perry Baker working on individual skills with him and the next session will be with a nature old girl so it's a pretty cool dynamic going look I'm I'm coaching the best player in the world here and then I'm coaching an eight year old beginner so it's it's uh it's a good challenge um I try to look at it that way yeah 100 percent and yeah I often think it as well that 
the best coaches are those ones that are coaching kids because it's so challenging. Like the the better the players get, the easier it is to coach them. Exactly. Absolutely. And and I think uh I think I heard Eddie Jones maybe say it once, like you get better at coaching by practicing coaching. Hmm. So so right away, I think for me, I went, how how can I coach seven days a week? Whatever it is, whatever level it is, it's going to make me a better coach quicker. Um, and that's why I think I just threw myself in there. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I found that as well, like, yeah, coaching so, so many, I nearly coach any team I can over here. And you just, I found as well, like you love coaching or I, I don't know, I do anyway, you know, regardless of the level, it's like, I just love being out there coaching, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, it, it is. It is a great feeling. And I think you're only really, like they're, ch- they're challenging days and they're tough days and frustrating days. But when you're away from it and you get back into it, you go, oh, God, I'm back. You know, so, yeah, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird feeling, but I'm sure every coach has had that feeling. Yeah. And so you were with doing the camps with Perry Baker and I've seen that. And is that like, uh, during like half term or in the kind of like off time from school is that how that how you do them yeah so um all public holidays um and yeah like half, half terms uh summer break thanksgiving break that kind of thing we kind of the way i looked at it was like how can i provide as much rugby to these players as possible um you know whether they want to drop in or not it's up to them but if you're there and you're relevant and you're providing that um that opportunity for the player to upskill then that's you know that's the best you can do so yeah as much as we possibly can to be honest um just depends you know my schedule's got busier and busier and he's obviously all over the world so we just fit it in when when we can yeah and with your schedule now what how many teams you're with or who are you coaching now (laughs) yeah so i'm i'm with the university of san diego we actually had our first official uh, practice last night so it's the fall semester which is basically pre-season it's sevens and pre-season 15 so it's them um, i've just started as lead coach of the san diego legion academy now, i haven't actually done any coaching yet um, just lots of planning and stuff um, and then i coach uh, there's a high performance training facility called proteus um, a guy called jason huntley who was the strength and conditioning coach of the san diego legion has this awesome facility and I basically run the rugby division of that which is uh, just weekly boys and girls come in for skills training and then they do strength conditioning training so it's just supplemental on top of what they're getting at their school and the club and they also run stuff through the summer there um, and then camps so I'm not sure if I've covered all of that but yeah sort of it's always like I try and compartmentalize four or five different jobs that I'm doing and I always like look at it like how am I going to do it all? But I end up being able to do it all, and I think it's just just keeps me on my toes and keeps me organized on time management and priorities and that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think four or five places. I'm not sure if I answered your question as no, I, as concisely as I could. No, you did. Yeah. No, I found as well. It's good to be busy. Like mm. it's good to be taking these things out. You'll find you'll find a way. You know, you take them on, then you'll find a way. Oh, exactly. It looks like you've got a lot going on, um, especially with the podcast and the coaching. Yeah, I like that as well. Just yeah, staying busy. Yeah, I just I, I love it as well. Like it's funny because I used to work in an office and you know, I'd work say eight hours a day or whatever, and it'd just be like the biggest drag ever. And now I do this and I'm like that. I, I'm just I technically probably working all the time. Like, you know, I'm like feel like it exactly it doesn't feel like it at all so it's i every day i've kind of thought or i had this realization every day feels like a summer holiday yeah like you know like i'm talking to you here or i'm like i'm no, whatever no, yeah when you're enjoying it, it doesn't feel like work and even for me like on, on an off day for me i'm like how can i fit in a private client today so that i can go work out and be in the sun i can pass a ball um you know you're right and like they often say like if you want something done ask a busy person because they're going to find a way to do it um but it's cool and i think that's what's driving me and probably you too is that you don't want to work you don't want to have a real job um 
which makes you want to be so good at what you actually are currently doing so that you can avoid that. Exactly, 100%. And talk to me about like the University of San Diego. So what, um, like, do they play in or what's the the rugby like there I used to I went in 2016 I went to the states uh coaching a player coach of Lindenwood and with the men's team then also coached the women's team after that um so I have a bit of an idea but yeah chat to me about uh, what you're up to with University of San Diego yeah so University of San Diego is actually it's, it's it's 40 it's almost 42 years old so it started in the 1980s so it's been around a while um we play in the D1AA division so one division below the, the top division. Um, I came in three years ago, two seasons ago, because obviously COVID um, basically cancelled one full season. Um, and uh, it's a small college, so it's, you know, it's, I hope I'm correct here, it's only about five to 6,000 students, maybe about 8,000 students. So if you say like, I think it's about 40% male. So there's more, there's more girls there. Um, so it's not, it's not a massive student body. Um, and the rugby club is still run by campus rec. Um, however, you know, there's a lot of passionate people involved. And three years ago, four years ago, we set up an alumni association um, with very ambitious goals of taking, you know, USD rugby to the next level. Um, and we've, we've made some really cool progress in the last three years. I think still a long way to go, but um, it is challenging because it's a private school. So it's, uh, you know, the tuition is, is really high and the acceptance rate is, is about 50%, just over 50%. So it's not an easy school to get into. So if we can, and we, and we can't help, you know, we, we can't help much with uh, scholarships or financial aid or that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's a, it's quite a challenge to be able to compete with, you know, these other schools that have real low tuition, acceptance rate, easy, um, massive student body. So, um, yeah, that's where we had, but we made some really good progress. Uh, last season, we won our league for the first time since 1994. So that was quite big. Um, and then we won the the red division uh, national sevens. So the D1 AA division national sevens in Atlanta. So that was pretty exciting. So um, now they want us to jump up and, and we're not quite ready to jump up just yet. We, we still need to build a little bit of depth and stability, but yeah, it's an exciting, it's an exciting thing to be a part of, um, you know, trying to get a team from relatively low down on the table, um, you know, up into a, into a higher division. Um, so yeah, it's good. That's that's cool and yeah, definitely a challenge with the recruiting. I remember when I was with Lindwood Women, we twenty seventeen, I think, toward that spring season, we went and played Stanford in like a quarterfinal of the national championships. And was chatting to the coach there, and he was like, "I can't recruit anyone. I have to like walk around campus and try and put up flyers and like ask people to come out training because like how do you recruit someone say oh do you want to come play rugby in Stanford then you have to get the grades and you have to try and get in and it's big challenge yeah exactly I'll probably get myself into trouble here but you know the, the top rugby schools in, in America you know, I like the Lindenwood uh, let's say Arkansas State Life uh, Cutstown St. Mary's like they're able to get students in and they're able to offer financial support. Um, and they are able to get foreigners over there because foreigners can afford to be there. So that puts them at a massive advantage. Now that the average American parent or American rugby supporter isn't aware of any of this. So when they comparing schools, you kind of go, look, yeah, fair enough. You know, they're pretty good, but you know, do you want to go to college in, uh, Missouri, or do you want to go to college in San Diego and live in Mission Beach? So it's uh, and go to a private private university um, in a very cool city. So it's man, there's a lot of context there. So it's it's quite a challenge. It's not easy, but you know it's it's a good challenge because we we're doing a lot with very little. Um, you know, and I think we're very proud of the fact that we've we've made um, some nice progress so far. Yeah, no, brilliant stuff. Yeah, and as you said, it's a challenge. Um, and with, I saw, were you with uh, LA Galtini's Academy for a while? 
Yeah, so last season I was a head coach of the LA Guilty Knees um, in the 18s and then just uh, assisted with the, the senior academy. Um, so, yeah, that was such a cool experience. Um, and uh, more for, for me, a foot in the door, um, you know, to, to MRR. Um, so there was, in terms of my professional development, man, it was, it was so cool. Um, it was quite tough driving up there. Uh, from San Diego a couple of times a month, but um, oh, it's awesome. Such good people and such a cool organization. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm glad I finally got a job in my hometown now and excited to stamp my mark. Nice. How long was the drive up? Um, I guess on a good day, it's two hours. Um, so, you know, it could be more, just depending on the traffic on the day. Um, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a massive commitment. It was a couple of Sundays, a couple of Saturdays a month. Um, I tried to get up on weekdays, but it was just too much. But the cool thing was how inclusive they were getting me in uh, with the senior team, just to be a fly on the wall and pick, pick guys' brains and, and see how they operate. And um, yeah, no, really, really cool experience. Good stuff. And then San Diego now with the Legion Academy. Talk to me a little bit about what the structure of an MLR team is. So I suppose everyone knows you see the senior teams play, but then, yeah, what's below that? Yeah, so you have your, your senior team, obviously, and that, that's probably a squad of about 30 now, maybe a little bit more. Um, but about 10 to 15 of those players are on what you call APC contracts, which is uh, associate player contract, which is a part-time contract where you'll get an hourly rate. Um, beneath that, now we're trying to create a senior development group. Um, now that group will be made up of players that be a part of the wider training group. There'll be students in San Diego and then club players in San Diego. So. Uh, if you look at it from an Irish perspective, you have your academy, which will be your senior development, and then there'll be the sub-academy, so to speak. Um, so that's what we're trying to create. We're trying to create a big base of players that will be part of the senior development group. And then you'll have the junior academy, which will be under 18s. Um, so there's, there's a bit of a separation there. Now, what's happened previously is that the MRR has basically said, look, you've got to set up academies and you've got to hit this criteria. Um, every year, and you'll get um, cap space incentive if you hit that criteria. So a lot of teams are kind of just put makeshift things together that's not actually sustainable and there's not much thought around long-term development. So we want to do it properly. And we want to make it almost a representative side um, whereby, like you, you used to, you know, you'll play for your school and you'll get selected for Leinster school or so less than the 19s or Irish in the 20s kind of thing. So we're trying to create that. Um, the great thing about San Diego is that we're sitting on a gold mine in terms of youth rugby. There's already a strong um, rugby community in San Diego, whereas other MR teams don't have the base and the grounding that we've got. So it's our job just not to stuff it up and to do it as well as we possibly can so that we have long-term sustainable um, Success, uh, when I say success, not success of the academy teams winning all the time and going out and beating Austin and Houston by 50 points. Success, in my mind, is the long-term player development. So that if we can produce Legion players out of San Diego or MR players out of San Diego, and that will then go on to become Eagles, in my opinion, that's what an academy is. It's around individual development. Um, in the most holistic um, approach, we can we can make it. Given the constraints, which is we're very time poor and these kids are very busy, so uh, yeah, that that's the structure in a nutshell. It hasn't always been that clear a structure, but that's what we're aiming for, at least in San Diego. Nice one. And then is that like a U twenty three, and you have an academy side that you said, and you go play against the other MLR academy sides uh yeah i think ultimately that's what we want to do at the moment not all the other mr teams are able to do that but yes that senior development group would for the most part be under 23s there might be a couple older players um who are just 
kind of young in their development, um, <clears throat> but they, they're over the age of 23. So, um, for example, in LA, we played against uh, the Glendale Raptors, which was a great challenge, or the Colorado Raptors, and we played a couple of touring teams, um, which was pretty cool. So the under 18s, I think they're a little bit more organized. These MR, these other MR teams, a little bit more organized around having uh, under 18 teams for that for that region, um, because not all regions have got the college and club set up that that other teams do. So we're pretty fortunate in San Diego. Okay, yeah, nice one, and. Switching up a bit with uh, your skills coaching, like if you're working one on one with a player, and I know this would be very different for different players, but what kind of things would you look at, or what kind of things would you work on? Um, yeah, I think it would just depend on that specific player and where they're at in terms of their development. Um, I think the majority of the stuff I do around here is very basic, fundamental skills coaching so the way i look at it if if you break up individual skills into five almost four or five categories um so if you're working one-on-one -on -one with the guy it's more technical it's more block practice um developing you know the right techniques um and it's very kind of detailed um whereas if it's a small group and then a larger group it's obviously it looks a little bit different um, but basically, if I break it up into catch pass support, so just general attack, but with focus on catch and pass, um, and then obviously movement off the ball. But evasive skills, so ball carrying evasive skills and the ability to create continuity through those evasive skills. So on in that same category, offload. Um, how, how do you create continuity after you've carried the ball? So that'd be two, three, uh, ball presentation and clean out. So when the guy does fall, how accurate is he at getting that ball as quickly and efficiently back as he can? Next guy coming in, how, how effective is he at moving, moving a threat or the decision around that ruck? Um, obviously, tackle technique, tackle completion would be four, and then kicking. Um, so I look at it like that with that individual, and then Outside of that position specific skills. So if I'm working with a line out thrower, then it'll be around those specific skills. If I'm working with a scrum off, it'll be around uh, pass off the base, pick and pull, probe and scoot, box kick, uh, almost like a topper pellet kick, running out grubbers, and just general awareness around game management and when to do that kind of thing. So Sorry, it's quite a broad answer to a, to a short question there, but that's the way I kind of compartmentalize or, or categorize it so that it can be as deliberate and intentional as possible. Yeah, nice one. No, that's brilliant. And then one thing I find interesting about with hooker throw, and you mentioned it there, I've that's one thing I've never done. And I can't, I like I, other things that are part of the game, I feel very competent and confident in. But um, yeah, hookers are throwing. So how would you help a hooker throwing? Yeah, so I actually, um, pretty early on when I started skills coaching, um, I reached out to a friend of mine back in South Africa who was a skills coach. And his expertise is line out throwing. And I mean, this guy's, yeah, his nickname's Miyagi, um, like Mr. Miyagi. So he's, he's a bit of a mad genius. Um, and he's basically explained it to me. And we actually wrote a book line out throwing 101 and it's actually it's actually on amazon but amazon i got it wrong and i can't change it so it's line up throwing so a little bit embarrassing but um he basically broke it down for me into the most simple mechanics possible um and then he's obviously sent me a ton of videos and challenged me around understanding actual movement and how do you simplify the movement for a beginner player so to speak so I played a bit of sevens. I'd never thrown in the line out in my life. And I had a crack and I was like, what is going on here? I, I don't know what I'm doing. And I was terrible. Even now, like I can explain it, um, the mechanics, the movement, what exactly I'm looking for. But when I do it, I haven't mastered the skill yet, but I can explain it to a player and he can then learn and actually do it. So 
it's one of those like funny things in coaching. Like I've had coaches, these old guys, and they're telling me what to do, but they can't do it themselves. And I go, how's this guy teaching me how to pass when he can't pass? We can't like, but now that I'm a coach, I kind of can understand that, look, you can have the awareness of what it's specifically to do and all the correct instruction, but you actually haven't nailed it yourself yet. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, my friend helped me out. Um, and I've had decent success. Um, players have got better, but, but I think it's, I think it's just, it's just quality repetition. So it's understanding the movement, getting the right technique or the most efficient technique for that specific player in his frame and then it's just it's just it's just mastering that specific skill but it's mate, it's so hard out here that is a skill that americans are they really struggle with line out throwing and kicking so yeah <laughs> yeah you mentioned it then kicking that's um that's another one that i when i came to north america didn't realize how challenging it was so in ireland I we most people play Gaelic football from the age of five. So like you're kicking Gaelic football is catch kick and like you're just always kicking the ball. Then at lunchtime in school you play soccer. So you're kicking the ball around the soccer around the yard. And then you play rugby and then you're just like kicking the ball with your friends as a kid. Yeah. And yeah, the kids up here then obviously play like basketball, baseball, you know, some sports like that, and then come to play rugby. And it's like it's challenging, isn't it? Yeah, so the awareness that you build up when you're a kid kicking a ball, especially in a place like Ireland where the majority of the sports is a lot of kicking, you develop extra sensory perception. It becomes, it becomes habit, just, it's just feel. And you know how to drop the ball and you know where to hit it on your foot and how it's meant to feel. Now, out here, the only guys that kick in football are the kickers and even them, they hold the ball completely contradictive to what we're trying to do in rugby. Um, so they're almost holding it falling forwards and when it falls it falls and then it's all over the show whereas we're trying to keep it upright and still and stable and then they're not sure where to hit it on their foot kind of thing um, so yeah it's, it's just not natural to them because they just they didn't grow up doing it unless they played soccer um, but you're so right especially in Ireland where you're playing you know Gaelic football and soccer and rugby like everyone can kick a ball if you go to a Five aside game. Everyone has feel, has touch. They can, you know, where's our chance? It's all over the show. Yeah. And uh, it's a funny one then. Like you see it sometimes on the, t on the TV, like even recently, Peter O'Mahony kicking a 50 22 or Tag yeah. Burn, Tag Burn awesome. kicking one. But like it's grown up in Ireland, it's just, it's not a thing. Like a forward kicking a ball, it's like, like obviously they kick the ball, you know, whereas I think others, it's like, oh, look at that. He can kick the ball. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think what I've found the, the drop as well, most players, when they're learning to kick the ball, they get the drop wrong and then nothing, you know, if you can't, if you don't get the drop right, everything goes. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, for me, it's, um, it almost starts before that. So it's arm extension. So you're going to put the ball to where your leg is going to swing through at its most, uh, at its quickest place, or its most consistent place. So a lot of them are holding it here, which is all wrong. So arms extended, okay, then it's the ball drop and often don't have the control to drop it with one hand. So it's like that, or it's throw up. And the ball goes up and then, you know, it wobbles. But if you can get stability in that ball drop, the rest should be fine. But you're 100 right. They just can't. They don't drop the ball. Um, they aren't keep, able to keep the ball as stable as they possibly can because they don't have that control. And obviously, they don't understand the movement or the mechanics or the trajectory involved in actually kicking a rugby ball. Um, but Jay, Matt, you you spot on. It's it's really hard. <laughs> yeah, and uh, as I was just chatting with this with Craig Ronson last week, but um. I think as well with with most skills or a lot of skills you can give these w one or two points which are very important but then it's like get the bag of balls and go out for two hours a day and just do it yeah yeah Matt, completely agree for me it's do it feel get like get as many touches as you can and then kind of start fixing the technique 
But when a kid comes in completely fresh, having not ever kicked the ball, very rarely, and you give that, and it's too technical right away, then you're kind of messing them up. So they need to kind of feel for themselves and research. Um, then you can kind of polish up their technique and just hope it's not too far gone that you can't fix their technique. Um, but if you've got the kid young enough, you should be able to fix it. Obviously, context, it depends on that specific player. But for the most part, you want to let them explore and then simplify it for them and polish up their, their technique. Yeah, 100%. And you mentioned two interesting things there. One was you said feel, and it's all about feel. Yeah. And how, as a coach, and I've made this mistake in the past, you can mess people up by giving them too much information. Yeah. And you obviously have the best intentions because you want to help the person. But, and sometimes the players want more information. They're like, you know, tell me, tell me, tell me. And, but yeah. I've just found that with a kick and another one is um, place kicking off a tee is it, it's all about getting that feel, uh, you know, that strike kicking through the ball. And a, a thing that I found, which is good, which I, I think is good and helps is um, with place kicking, all kicking, I suppose, um, kicking into a net or into a fence so that you're not constantly looking at the post and does it go in or not? And you're just, you're forced to focus on the feel of your strike with the ball. Yeah, just, pro, you know, focus on the process, not the outcome, so to speak. Um, yeah, you're spot on. Obviously, there's lots of different strategies and, and ways of teaching that, but you're 100% right. You, you kind of need to elude the player and go, look, just focus on this process, because if you get this process right, the outcome will take care of itself. But don't judge your process on what the outcome was for example so if they kick the ball and it just goes all over the show but their process was close to spot on you're like mate you're, you're on the right track next one you know one little adjustment and you're right so yeah it's you know it's, it's just tricking the player a little bit um you know trying to take their focus away from the bigger picture kind of focus on what's in front of them first and then build up to the bigger picture um, but yeah, there's a little bit of psychology involved there, um, which is a lot, a lot of stuff I wanted to ask you around the, the mindset stuff and the, the mental skill stuff um, about what you're doing. Because well, what, what we're finding, especially at Proteus, is that a lot of these players and these young, these young players, they, they just don't have the mindset formed yet um, to do what they want to do. And it's not their fault. They just haven't been in an environment or they haven't had it at home where, look, this is how you need to be. And then here are the skills available to you to deal with what you're dealing with. Um, yeah, what exactly are you doing in that space? I was, I was curious to, to hear. Yeah, so <clears throat> a big thing, yeah, I essentially help players play in the zone, help players deal with, it's often, you know, nerves and outside influences which will stop players from playing in the zone and you know yourself you call it the flow state in the zone whatever you want to call it you know yourself that when you're playing that time and everything is slowed down and it just seems easy and it's you're not thinking about what the coach is going to say you're not worried about making a mistake you're not you're not worried about you know all these different things you're just playing and to give players confidence and self-belief in themselves yeah and it's interesting you mentioned there about outcomes and processes when it comes to physical skills and <clears throat> it's crucial and that's what we're chatting about there and with mental skills it's the exact same and we as people are you know players but we're always so focused on outcomes Will I make the team? Will I be there next year? Will I get the recognition that I want to get? Will we win this game even? Bring it back that far. Will we score the try in five minutes? Or we're always just focused on outcomes. And all those outcomes, like once again, with the physical skills are in the future. And it's all about the process. And with playing, if you can peel it back as well and not be so focused on outcomes, it, 
that's where the love of the game is. That's where you play your best rugby. And it's helping players to understand that and to bring it back. And don't get me wrong, like as a player, you need to have big dreams and big goals and you have to want to go somewhere. But you're aware of that and then you you kind of nearly forget about it and you focus on, once again, on the process and just loving playing. And when I, I often kind of say like, I don't know if you play soccer in South Africa, but when we were in Ireland, we play soccer at lunchtime yeah. and you are just playing. You're like, you think, I just think I'm David Beckham. I'm running around. I'm kicking ball. I'm, you're so in the moment. It is yeah. crazy yeah. as a kid. And then as you grow up, you start to think about like, what is the coach going to think? Am I going to make the team? Am I looking good? Do the other players think I'm good? Do all this stuff goes into your head and it just, it essentially kind of fucks you up a bit and it just freezes you. So, yeah, so I help players. A big part of it is helping them to play in the zone and enjoy their rugby. And it all, it all comes together. It's all part of the same thing. And another part of it is to help players dream big and go after it. So you will never surpass your biggest dreams if you say if you sit sit here and say as a coach be like i want to be the san diego legion academy coach and that's all i'm ever good enough to do that's all i'll ever do that is all you will ever do yeah. but if you dream big you know if if we dream big we, we can go after it and people are afraid of dreaming big you know self-doubt comes in you know self-worth is tied into that and you're just like oh i'm not good enough and you know, to give players the confidence and self-belief to go after their dreams. And, you know, often as a player, you kind of, you defeat yourself because you say to yourself, like, well, I'm not good enough to go do that yeah. and you'll never do it. So, yeah. you know, part of it at the start when I work with players one-on-one -on -one, um, is helping players, yeah, realize their dreams. And what will always happen is, I'll say like, oh, what, what would you like to do in rugby? And they'll say something like achieve. I'll tell you one, actually. I was um, chat with a player 18 uh, for just before, last summer, say 18 months ago, 12 months ago. Yeah. And I was like, oh, what, what would you like to do? What's your goals for this year? And they said, I want to start in the team. And I was kind of like, come on, what, what really do you want to do? And they go, I want to be the best player in the team. I want play, people to come to watch me play. I want to be like a standout. And that's 12 months ago. This player now is carving it up on the World Series. Wow. And that's they awesome. were, yeah. And like, they have it in them. And yeah. it's unreal, because I could see it in them. But they, you know, and it's just helping players to, yeah, just to dream big and just yeah. to go after it. Yeah, mate, that's awesome. That's and that's so interesting, and I think it's so relevant because I think that's an area that we neglect so much, and it's almost like people put it in the same space as like mental health. Like, yes, it is mental health, but it's actually mindset formation um, and developing awareness and developing the skills to get yourself into the right position. But you're so right, like that player didn't have the awareness and he didn't have the confidence and he couldn't, you know, he couldn't, I assume he couldn't emotionally figure out where he needs to be or where he could be kind of thing. And a guy like you is able to go, look, I can see it from a different perspective and I can give you the tools to get there, but you need to be vulnerable and you need to, you know, let's set goals. So have your big, hairy, audacious goal. And then I'm going to help you on the journey to get there. And we're gonna focus on that journey. And by chipping away at that journey, before you know it, you're gonna be even past that, if you know what I mean. Um, so I think it's really cool what, what you're doing. We, we actually use, we use a couple of books by Joshua Medkoff um, at Proteus at our, at our training facility. And he's written a couple of books that are all fictional, but they all tell a story with all these, all these lessons in them. And uh, it's, been, it's been so cool seeing these players read the books. They give a book review to the rest of the group. 
and what they're going to take away from it and then how they relate that to their specific goals and stuff but and i think it's just finding a way to get to relate the material or relate the lesson to that specific player and i think that is the skill as a coach is that if you can speak to his heart so to speak and build that rapport and that personal relationship you're able to give him even more because he's vulnerable and willing to learn so to speak um, that's cool stuff Brian. that's awesome man cheers yeah 100 and uh, you just said a great thing there is uh, vulnerable and yes. that's what it takes so like i mentioned with this player like i want to start in the team um that's easy and they will achieve that goal like i knew like i you know i was like they'll achieve that goal but it's very vulnerable for them to go and say that they want to be the best player in you know in the league and just for to be a superstar essentially yeah. and because you can fail at that and that's something as well that with our goals is that we often set goals that we know we're going to achieve yeah and you something i say you got to dare to be great you got to you know you and it takes it's vulnerable it's you know it's for you to even even one even on, in a quiet space on your own yeah you're writing down your goals yeah it's hard to even be vulnerable with yourself nearly to say like yeah. i want to achieve this because it scares you you're like oh there's a good chance i'll fail but there has to be a good chance you'll fail and i think it's richard branson who says your dreams should scare you yeah no you should be you know it should terrify you because that's what's going to challenge you and that's going to keep you the most aware because you saw you you're just not comfortable you know you're not complacent there's no space for complacency um but uh yeah man i'm loving the books behind you jenga ferguson love it uh man have you watched the the new all or all or nothing on arsenal no on I, video? i have to because i've it's heard so some... good i binged on it like last week and i'm just like obsessed now but like that's the power of these documentaries is that they know how to create the narrative that just like sucks you in but um yeah is their new manager no is, is Arteta. Just, yeah mate, some such like really good qualities in there and you can see that he's still learning as a coach and you can see he's still a little bit vulnerable but also but also very um you know it goes with his heart as in he, he he backs himself um but like good lessons around like without giving it away i'm going to tell you this one uh they go up to play against liverpool and him and uh, klopp get into a, an altercation basically on the sidelines and that revved up the crowd um at anfield and arsenal just had a shocker and arteta obviously the next week you can see that like he wanted to show how passionate he was and he's backing his young guys but that was probably in hindsight the, the worst thing he could have done and i'm sure he learned from that so as like a 40 year old manager in the premier league at one of the top clubs you can still see that as a coach like no matter how many good qualities he's got he's still like and i don't know it all yet you know um no it's really cool like you'll love it yeah i'm gonna start watching that tonight because you're probably the third or fourth person <laughs> in the last while that's mentioned to me i'm like all right gotta get on it Um, I'm just putting my I'm just putting my laptop on charger. I'm running running flat, but we can carry on. All good, yeah, yeah, all good. Um, and what I won't give you too much longer. What coaches no do you admire or like? Oof. Um, in in rugby or or all sports? All sports, yeah, all, and obviously not to know yeah. inversely, but who, what yeah. coach do you look at and be like, oh, yeah? Uh, honestly, Sean McVay. The LA Rams, you know, obviously he won the Super Bowl, but when he first took over the Rams at age 32, I was just, I couldn't believe how well he communicated with the media and the way, the, how well he held himself and how clear and concise and articulate he was. I loved that right away as a 32-year-old coach. And for me, for inspiration as a young coach, I went like, wow, if I could be like that, or if I could take some of those qualities and try and keep almost a neutral mindset um and and deliver a message as well as he can that's one you know that's 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 something i like um 
rugby coaches, um, the classic, like I'm hitting a blank now. Um, I really like Dave Rennie. Um, I think a lot of Kiwi coaches, they just, they're just so stoic. Like they, they just so like, they don't give much away, but they always look like they got things in control. I've chatted to people who played under Dave Rennie and they, it's like the greatest guy ever, but I've also chatted to people who uh, weren't in favor with him at Glasgow have said like the opposite and that Kiwis think that Kiwis know everything. So that's, that's an interesting one. I like him though. Um, obviously like Pep, you know, from what I've, what I've seen of him, um, I mean, I'm sure I'm going to look back at this answer and go, yeah, I should have said him. Um, Gary Kirsten a, is a former South African cricketer and cricket coach. Uh, things I've listened to from him are pretty cool. Uh, he, he seems like, I think for the most part, all these coaches just have a, a real, like, good emotional intelligence and self-awareness. They can, they're just so good at facilitating. Um, they, they're so good at facilitating a group handling a group, managing a group. Oh, from a rugby point of view, Tony Brown. Uh, he seems pretty like quirky and crazy. Um, just a little bit out of the box and obviously quite a cult, a cult hero, cult figure in Togo, New Zealand, done really well in Japan. Um, guy I really enjoy following is a guy called Ryan Martin, uh, who was the New England Free Jacks coach. Melbourne Rebels attack skills coach, and now he's actually with Toyota. Um, but he puts out puts out some really cool, interesting stuff on his on his Twitter account, which I really enjoy. Um, yeah, just to name a few. <laughs> yeah, no good stuff. I I like um yeah what Dave Rennie is doing with Australia. I like yeah you know the way he's got that team play. He's got young lads in. Yeah. Um, those young lads look like they're kind of free to express themselves and yeah yeah absolutely also uh from a from an irish point of view i really um like the story around felix jones um now he's with obviously with the box as a young coach uh russi is obviously from what i've heard an outstanding coach um you know you you can see what he's done and just how different he is but i've also heard stories from players that have played with him how just how creative he is around things. Um, but when he obviously brought Felix Jones in and then watching Chasing the Sun documentary, the role that Felix Jones actually played, I thought that was pretty cool of backing a young guy because he, he knows the game, you know, and he's and he's passionate and he's so I really like what he's doing. Um, yeah, sorry. Le all the Leinster coaches are also amazing. Yes, Lancaster's, I love listening to anything he speaks about. He just, he just he makes it so clear um, and simple. Makes it seem like that, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, no, they've yeah. done great work too because Leinster hit a lull there for a few years before he came in and Leo Cullen and uh, yep. yeah, they're also doing great work. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Mill, for your time, Charlie. Been unreal chatting. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I think we could chat for like 10 hours. So we must definitely, uh, definitely be in touch after this and, and share more stuff. For sure, 100%.